Hello and good morning. And I am wildly excited to be joined right now by Mr. Caleb Daniels, who is uh, uh, working on a project that I'm so ridiculously excited about. I can't even believe it. The license, I oh know, licensed troubleshooter, The Guns of James Bond. Ah, it's by Headstamp Publishing. Caleb, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me and tell me all about this book. How are you doing? Doing well, man. How are we this morning? It's good to be back on. I am stoked. Chatting. I got up this morning and I was just like stoked to be chatting to you about this. So, but first of all, I want to say like your backdrop is amazing. It's so interesting to have like watched your, you appeared a couple of years ago, a few years ago as Commando Bond and like to watch how all of the different projects you've been involved on have progressed and things like now you have a, a backdrop. I mean, look at that. That's gorgeous. Where is that wall from? Uh, it's from Hold Up Displays. So they, they just do slat wall stuff. So they've got that, but then, so I love this, and then I'm a huge fan of this guy over here. This is a 1930s legal filing yeah. cabinet. So it's this stamped steel. It's actually a drawer in there somewhere that has a July 4, 1911 patent date on it, which, as a good American, you know, having that yep. date on anything just is perfect. So it's a great bookshelf slash organization kit for all the holsters and miscellaneous items and everything else that we we have. Uh, and, you know, so it's just fun. It, it fits everything together aesthetically. I love it. It's, it is totally my aesthetic because I'm like, I'm, I'm, a, I know I'm British, but I've all, ever since I was a kid, I wanted to move to America. It was like my dream. I wanted to be a cowboy more than anything. That's why I have my cowboy hat because I'm like, I didn't move <laughs> to America to not wear a cowboy hat. Uh, but, but as a kid, uh, I was obsessed with like old pulp movies and pulp books and cowboys, especially. And so, like, you, you mix the aesthetics of what I'm really into, which is like, vintage james bond stuff and that vintage aesthetic with like guns and i don't know it's cool what you're doing like Appreciate resonates that. with me and it resonates with a ton of people which i guess is how it got started to this idea of when did you get this idea to write a book about the guns of james bond yeah so i knew I wanted to do this book for a long long time uh, like since i was a kid i knew i wanted to write something or other um and it was just one of those things where what, what do i do well i'd been in the industry for now it's been almost 10 years in the firearm space. But um, when I was in the industry, when I was in high school, I got introduced to the Vickers Guide series, which is the beautiful coffee table books by Larry Vickers with James Rupley, uh, who does all the photography. And, you know, it was one of those things that were broke high school, college kid, kind of unobtainable, right? Museum quality books, you know, about $100 retail. And you're like, man, but, you, but I knew of them and I saw them often and I saw the photography and like, whenever I get around to doing the thing I want to do, this is what it needs to look like. This is the standard it has to be held to. Um, so even and, then you'd thought that what you might write would be nonfiction? Out of the gate, yeah. I mean, I I, I was the kid, I, I joked that um, I, I hit 40 by 12. I had to <laughs> that had, uh, you know, everyone's like, you know, you're turning your dad's age when you get all the World War II nonfiction. I had that yeah. in Vietnam by the age 10 to 15. So um, I was reading that like in bulk and I've got, got a handful of those books up here and another on a shelf over there and enough in tubs and waiting for more shelving to be built to, to kill a man three times over. So I just I absorbed all that stuff so much and I loved the storytelling aspect of that. And uh out of the gate, at least, I said, yeah, you know, that'd be that'd be the kind of thing to start on is to kind of blend these passions of mine. And that was you know, even at that time, <clears throat> I, I worked in the industry. Right. And I had access to all these toys, um, everything standard fare that people traditionally kind of gravitate towards. But because I had access to it, I didn't really bother with it. I'm like, OK, yeah, I can shoot it anytime I feel like it. So back then, even I was exclusively collecting the guns of James Bond. My first handgun was a PPK. Um, I spit money i probably shouldn't have on a beretta 418 when i was halfway through my college oh yeah can you can you uh, hold that one up again i love that of course yeah because i remember reading casino royale and, and reading about the skeletal stock and and like back yeah, when yeah. i first read that book you couldn't go to google and like type in what it looks like so you know i imagined something in my head and then it's so cool you've got the actual real thing right there yeah, and it's a great little gun too and so that was kind of the fun part for me it's like okay great let's start collecting this stuff and then it was like okay like let's share the knowledge. So we started the account and I started kind of learning photography and figuring out and just kind of self teaching myself through all that stuff and figuring it out and trying to grow it into something that could, in my mind, create a megaphone for my industry and normalize it through this lens of pop culture. To me, that's a really important thing. Uh, so that's, that's where the whole account 
came together. And from there, it was, okay, great. I've wanted to write a book forever. I transitioned out of the industry two years ago. Um, and I went from working 60 to 70 hour weeks to a corporate gig that worked about a quarter of that at best. And I was really bored. Um, so I, I, I went to go see who the heck did the Vickers Guide series and found out that James Rupley um, was the photographer. And what made it even better was that he was following me on Instagram. So I, I, I was able to pitch directly to him. I didn't go through their headstamp form or anything else. I was like, hey, man. This is what I'm after. This is what I think we can do. And thankfully, since he was following me, he knew that I wasn't just, you know, some random guy off the street. I had built up some sort of credibility with him, I guess. So he took the call and Ian McCollum, the, his partner at Head Stamp, got pulled into a call about a week later. He and I, you know, you know, bantered a little bit, uh, pushed over what we thought Bond guns should be and all this fun stuff. And uh, from there, we signed papers and we started running. So for me, it was always I wanted to create a Vickers Guide quality book with deep level information about the world of James Bond. And I knew I could only do it with the right people. And I was able to do just that. I love, I mean, that's the, the, the other thing that I find really exciting about what you're doing, because I'm passionate about uh, independent publishing and self publishing. And I think the most exciting independent publisher going is head, headstand publishing. Oh, yeah. I mean, they produce these beautiful, as you said, like museum quality books that have this incredible photography this this in the the, the like the close-ups that you can mm -hmm. open it up and there's a whole page uh that you look it's almost like having something right in your hands the quality yeah. of the, the, <laughs> the photos writing. really feel like you can just lift right up and out which is perfect yeah and and the the people who write them people like jonathan ferguson from the the yep. royal armory in leeds it's like these are the people who know everything about this and everything is like meticulous like they are world-class uh pieces of art in sort of literary form and headstamp as a publisher is just the model that they use to bring these things is, mm -hmm. is just amazing i mean i found out i was a weird juxtaposition from i was following you and then through you i started watching on youtube like forgotten weapons with ian mccullum and i watch every that's single cool. video that comes out i that's how i found out about jonathan ferguson um mm -hmm. it was you know he's got the guns and also the video games that he goes on so i started following yeah, people then completely uh irrelevant i was doing the podcast that we do about publishing chatting to the vice president of publishing at kickstarter about the most successful projects and then boom jonathan ferguson's books there ian mccollum's books there head stamp publishing right there they are like have this incredible model and like i don't know it's it's so exciting to see something that i'm passionate about like james bond being put forward uh in a way that is just i mean it, it is world class i don't think you could have gone to a better through a better format to bring this to, to reality so and no, was, I mean, for me it could it couldn't be another just self-published magalog sort of thing like it yeah. had to be because i deeply care about these pieces it had to be something that wasn't just okay cool yeah here's some photos it really wanted to be like you said like an experiential thing when someone opens that book someone like you that maybe had never seen these guns before and had formed a mental image i want you to be able to see every machine mark nook cranny detail and absorb it and then that's what permeates your your brain as you as you read these books and as you go on these adventures and you know the and then of course if you happen to read what I've written great but at least you got the photos otherwise. Well, AJ, so I got a book here. This is when I was like seven or something. I had this exact book. It's leather bound. It's part of a huge set that used to used to mail in like ten dollars a month and get a new book sure. every build up set. And it was all about the gunfighters in the Wild West. But it had these beautiful pictures of the guns mm -hmm. and you could read them out. And I, as a kid i just used to be obsessed with like remembering all the details like you know my my pin codes used to be like what the what year the uh single action cult army came out which was talking about 1800s you're getting me a little uh, like to 8 a.m brother <laughs> fair enough yeah it was, i think it was 18, 1873 i thought but i'm i don't know someone's gonna i'm talking that. colt navy that's my problem i've got one upstairs colt navy's like 1860s 1870s so it's in that range eli will kill me for not knowing that date but you know i'm also doing a british style takeover of his alchemy account this week just to make him mad so you know it is what it is oh but but uh, yeah those books i loved and so and it goes to the thing of james bond i loved your video that you did with ian mccullum where you were talking about all the guns that were wrong and how uh yeah. there's there's always been this certain ambiguity in the James Bond books because Ian Fleming wasn't necessarily like the biggest gun guy. And that whole video did about um, 
James Bond's long army, long cult that he had in his bed. Yeah, the long barreled cult army special 45 or whatever version yeah. of that word salad was in the, in the novels. Yeah, and when I was a teenager reading Moonraker for the first time, and for a long time it was my favorite book, and I just, you know, I used to drive a little oh, Trump yeah. sports car, and I used to imagine having a long army cult there, and I didn't know what that gun was. And yeah, back then I couldn't go to Google and look it up. And then even if I could, it didn't matter because there was that ambiguity there. But that yeah, there's still a huge debate around it. And so that's something you explore, though. You dedicate part of the book to that, don't you? There's a pretty sizable section on on that particular firearm because mm -hmm. the video is kind of a preamble to that where we because I, i'm very very detail oriented when it comes to that stuff so the last thing i wanted to do is present you an argument i believe this is x and then just leave it at that i wanted to go through every possible model conceivably and discuss perhaps why it couldn't be where where the shortcomings of that could perhaps be but then also like okay well if you don't bite this argument here's everything else that you could potentially be visualizing and so if you're dissatisfied with what I provide you in the end as my argumentation, the very least, at least you know what it could be and what those models look like. That's so cool. And then you don't just stop there. You go into the continuation novels, which I think is yes. wild. I read those again as a teenager and I like the John Gardner ones are a bit uh, wild. So they are very hit and miss. I, I, I think I told you I had a fever dream summer where I read every <laughs> single one of those books in a row. Oh, and... wow. I felt like I was getting gaslit by Gardner because I swore that I had just read one of the books. And I went back, I'm like, no, sure enough, this is enough. The amount of times that the Third Reich rose for the eighth time was very impressive. And it was all about the same way, too. I'm like, opening up, like, I feel like I've read this book. Like, if there's another triple cross happening, that can't be right. I must yeah, have just, loves I must a triple have just cross. oh, man. And I was like, oh, no, that was three books ago. And so it was, it was a very long summer of like, guessing my way through and ensuring that I was actually devouring them in order and, you know, all, all of that. And then that was befuddling even further because I was doing deep level research for that entire summer into the, the ASP nine millimeter and, yeah. and all the mysterious years, people bro. associated with it. Yeah. Yeah. He introduced that in role of honor. So there's a lot of ambiguity about that thing. And the, the, the research is basically, you know, I'm sure you understand this in the writing world, but like, cyclical reporting one dude whispers something and then that becomes fact yeah and so i had to go back to the original sources figure out where that person might have heard that and then rabbit hole my because I'm, I'm very dissatisfied with just like rehashing partial fiction so i thought this was most of these guns because there's a lot of good documented information three weeks of like deep level lower research mainly because i knew a lot about a lot of these anyway three months of revisiting and rewriting and cutting thousands of words just from that gun section just because it became the bane of my existence because there's only so many ways you can use the word purportedly and there's so many <laughs> you know the thesaurus runs low after a while yeah oh i mean that's and it, i think these days you know there's a lot more gun literacy like people mm -hmm. the, the, people care about these things you watch no time to die and you cared that he went in with a mark 18 oh i think ed wars and stuff and he wants yeah, to know yeah, what Mark yeah Whereas Dr. No, like, as you said, every single gun was a was the wrong gun and some of them were the wrong gun for the wrong gun. And people didn't care because back in the 60s, there wasn't the same gun literacy. No, no. And I also think, you know, as budgets continue to expand, there's a lot more thoughtfulness in every aspect of a, of a picture, right? Like Dr. No, they, they did the best with what they had and they produced an amazing piece. And you, you saw that progress as time went on and the literacy kind of continued to expand. You know, you, you see... PPK finally show up in From Russia with Love. You see unique firearms continue as the partnerships grow. Like you only live twice um, in the late 60s has the MBA gyrojet rifles and carbines and pistols, which are, they were very experimental at the time. Um, I actually had the privilege, the NRA Museums has one that was more than likely made for the film. It has a serial number that I believe is JB0007. Um, and I got to hold that, which is really cool. Um, so that that's the one that you fired the bullet and then it had a little uh like a, a rocket in the bottom back it was there. literally a, a rocket propelled yeah. cartridges that's so wild yeah so you had little three little you know jets in the back that would spin around and uh and what's even crazier is we found use cases where you know mac v sog special forces operators in vietnam actually were fielding those we can't guarantee if they were used in combat but mac v sog was very passionate about non-traditional weaponry and so 
they brought some of those in. There's photos of men with them in their hands in the jungles of Vietnam. That's wow. crazy. Because that kind of seems like sci-fi now. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating and it makes sense for what they wanted it to be, right? Because the rocket is inherently subsonic, therefore it's suppressed. But it because of the pressure, you know, in theory it was it was armor piercing and everything else because of the the speed that it got out of there and then the fact that it kept propelling itself forward. So fascinating, fascinating stuff. And you know, that's one of the things I really enjoyed about Licensed Troubleshooter as well is I didn't want to stop at just where the firearms of Bond existed in his hands. We expand out and we talked to an incredible number of Special Forces veterans from across the world about their use of James Bond firearms and equipment in combat. And I, I think, did I see it on your thing about like the Walter PPK, suppressed Walter PPK was used in Vietnam by Special yeah, so SOG, some of the coolest stuff, man. So SOG, um, which if you haven't read any of the books about Mac B. SOG, John Plaster has some great books. Um, the gentleman we interviewed, John Stryker Meyer, incredible individual, very, very nice man. Um, both are veterans of Mac B. SOG, but in Plaster's books, he confirms that in the first ever recorded halo jumps in combat history, it was something that kind of came up in the late World War II. That's era, high but, altitude, um, low opening, isn't it? Great correct, level. correct. And then yeah, open up just a good primer that if you watch Tomorrow Never Dies, right? They get the little, <laughs> so the little like in interplay to explain what that means. Um, so yeah, the, the first time it had ever been fielded in combat was by Mac V. Sog in Vietnam because they were having issues with um, th what they were doing previously was quick chopper landings. Everyone gets out, does yeah. the mission. They were going into the Laos and Cambodia, which we weren't supposed to be in. And so information started getting disseminated they didn't know where the leak was coming out and they were getting ambushed upon landing so they were trying to find more clandestine ways even than that to get in so the halo jump became an option uh, so they did i think five total jumps but plaster reports that sidearm of choice and a few of those for at least a couple members of sog was a suppressed walther ppks or ppk as he calls it but i found the requisition log which calls yeah. for a ppks which implies that's what it would be um and he says that those were carried on the chest, similar to oh. Goldeneye. So in Goldeneye, he wears that tactical vest and has a, has yep. a report, and it goes cross draw like that. So similar to that, he they use that as a as a suppressed pistol potentially on the chest with the silencer already affixed when they did the halo jumps. Now what they were used for, we don't know. What we can infer from what other firearms of that size and caliber were used for was. The NVA were very fond of guard dogs and hunting them down with with dogs, and so they often would would eliminate those threats with a suppressed high standard, you know, carryover from World War II, um, so 22 LR. But you know, perhaps they went to a center fire cartridge as well. Other options were they would also they they did a lot of a uh, forceful extraction of NVA folk, so that <laughs> often involved relieving them of a kneecap or two. Um, <laughs> You know, that could very well be another opportunity or option there. Or, you know, close quartered, um, you know, good night is, is kind of what that could be. So, this, But the fact is, what you know, we, we can speculate and imply how it could have been used. The fact is they, they were requisitioned. They were there. And I had this beautiful conversation with John the other day, John Stryker Meyer, uh, where he said, you know, he's like, he had distinct memories of shooting the PPK on their test range in Vietnam, watching all of his friends shoot it. And he's like, it's like, you better believe that we were striking the pose and blowing the smoke out of the silencer. <laughs> so, you know, guys in Vietnam doing James Bond things, you know, not very far from, at the same time, by the way, not very far from Japan where Sean Connery's filming You Only Live Twice at the exact same time with the exact same firearms. Yeah. And so that story alone made me go, we have to make sure these real world stories are included because none of this exists in a vacuum. They were all, all happening at the same time. I think that's that's the wonderful thing about the Bond community and being part of the Bond fandom is it opens up infinite rabbit holes you can go down. Absolutely. And, and for me, like I I find this utterly fascinating. It's like all every single gun in the films or in the books you have a story about. It's like I love that video about Doctor No, where uh, the different guns, um, the the whole thing about uh, oh yeah, the, the Russian nesting dolls, how it's a. PP yeah. instead of a PPK, but then it's an FN instead of the PP, and then it's a high power instead of a PP, and then it's a 1911 instead of a high power instead of a PP. <laughs> it's just rabbit hole. 
and I love it. And I mean, the wonderful thing is these little these little stories kind of link together different parts of the fandom. Because if you you love the movies and you love like the movie industry, and then you love the James Bond movies and you love guns, suddenly the movie industry and the guns come together in a way because you're finding out how the practicalities of filming a movie affected what guns were used. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that another great example of that outside of James Bond is like a. This happened in a lot of franchises, but you know, Indiana Jones is a great example of that. He carries a high power when yep. he should have been carrying, and what they were intending him to carry was in 1911, because the high power came out the same year or the year before in Raiders, so he wouldn't even had the model that he had on hand anyway. But 45 ACP does not cycle blanks super well, so that forced a change of hand, and they moved to nine millimeter, which is why the high power appears in that Raiders bar fight scene instead of a 1911. So it's it's fascinating little stuff like that. We're like, and the same thing happened in Magnum PI. Magnum PI is 1911's a nine millimeter because nine millimeter cycles blanks more consistently. It's standing in for what everyone assumes is a 45, but it, it was a nine millimeter. Um, so it's just little idi idiosyncrasies like that that are kind of the fascinating behind the veil kind of thing that you can learn um, and go, okay, cool. Like, So when you collect, and then it opens all the rabbit holes. So when collecting, do I... Do I buy the stand-in or do I buy the correct one? And frankly, I just tell people both. But you know, it, it <laughs> creates that kind of like the dynamic and dialogue. Like, what what do I want? Like, do I go correct to what was on the screen or what it should have been? Or it's just so much fun. And it, it, you know, it opens all sorts of conversations. And like I said earlier, it gets people into my world because they are fascinated by characters that they care about and the tools that they use. And suddenly, like we did at Griffin and How, they're taking part in a shooting experience and becoming comfortable with something that they maybe never would have touched before yeah i mean I, I loved that especially the alchemy 1911s were just amazing because i'm the uh the 1911 is like and i as oh there we go look at it it's a thing of beauty yeah to me it's i as iconic as like the the peacemaker revolver it's like that oh is, yeah it's so difficult. I mean, America, the, the freedom to own guns and civilian gun ownership. I know people are like waging war against it and saying it's dangerous, but it's so intrinsic to what America is. Yeah. And so you have these guns that are just icons of it, like the 1911. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my friend Eli makes a really good point. He and I talk a lot about firearms and stuff, obviously, but, you know, he, he made a point to me the other day that I, I guess I, I had known, but I never fully considered was that a lot of countries existed well before the advent of firearms. You know, he, he calls the 1911 the Claymore of the United States because it's just the, oh, I like that. the definitive art of, of, yeah. our, of our generation and of, of our people. But truly, you know, America has not existed ever without the firearm. You know, um, people came over here, the firearm was already in existence. It became a cornerstone. It became the piece over the mantle. It became the tool of the West. And throughout the last you know, two, 200, through almost, you know, as we, as we move forward years of history, the handgun has become the quintessential American arm instead of the musket over the fireplace, because it's the defensive arm. It's the one you can keep yeah. with you every single day. It's, it's that utilitarian tool. And so, yeah, it's the 1911 is a quintessential American piece. It's something that everyone needs in their collection. If they're a good red blooded American and or <laughs> convert like yourself. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. That's all that matters. What does I say? Born in England, but made in America. That's what I, but um, I mean, guns like James Bond. I think one of the reasons we loved James Bond as a kid growing up in England, it's like you would like be sneaking around trying to be the, the sneaky yeah. secret agent with the guns because um, it is such an, like, it's such an intrinsic part of who he is and his character. Yeah. It's disingenuous when that starts kind of getting removed. Um, I know it's, I know you've talked about this before on videos and stuff, but like the, the constant apology tour that seems to go on with how Bond as a character has existed, whether it's, you know, James Bond's books now getting edited to remove historical, you know, writing and changing the vernacular or whatever the case may be, whitewashing, or in the case of Eon Productions, slowly trying to walk back and eliminate the, the gun barrel motif off the 007 logo in as many of their partnerships as possible. It's just one of those little silly things that's so nonsensical and frankly so disingenuous. You, you you built everything off of a hero that is competent, capable, and safe with a tool. And then you you say, well, yes, but to stay in vogue with particular social circles that we do so, so deeply care about, we must eradicate a core function of a character from public life because 
we as people are disgusted by what we've created. We're apologizing for our ancestors. I mean, that's definitively what the Ian Filling Publications House is doing, and that's definitively what it seems that Eon has started to slowly do. And it's it's unfortunate because I think the reality is you can have a discussion about how you feel personally about particular things. And even if you disagree with everything I have on the table in front of me today or on the wall, if you can't acknowledge that that can exist in the world of fiction or on a logo because your fictional character does that, I think there's something inherently wrong with how you're viewing the world and how you cope with the world around you. And yeah. I think that is a discussion that people aren't comfortable having. And I think it's a disservice to themselves not to have it. And it's like, it's like this, uh, communal sense of narcissism where the world has to change to meet your expectations rather than you change your expectations to match the world but and the thing that annoys me with eon trying to roll back the, the guns in there and ian fleming publications censoring the original james bond books is the people who are pressuring them to do this are not the people who support them they, they're not the people who buy the books the people no. and the people who do you know get it's it, it seems like cannibalism by by catering to an audience who don't support their existence, they are cannibalizing their own existence. Yeah, and it, it, especially for me, it, it's further disappointing when they're going into self-publishing mode, you know, and at the end of the day, you're like, you're going to produce these for the first time in-house, and I would have been thrilled to purchase books, but on a moral standing, I just can't. Like, I, yeah. I, I appreciate the text for what it is, and it's not like I'm reading them and then throwing slurs out there thinking like Ian Fleming did in 1950. I'm having a genuine conversation with myself and others about what the world was like and how it's dynamically changed in the same way I can read all quiet on the Western front and have a really good understanding of what world war one trench warfare was like for people. Um, you know, primary source fiction is a very important tool for history. I think it frankly does more sometimes than, the nonfiction, or yeah, I mean, truly, like when you read Atlas Shrugged, you get a really strong understanding of what people's phil philosophical beliefs, whether you believe in what Anne Rand is saying or not, at that time, because she reads you essentially the the worldview of three people in both of her novels, and I think I think running from that is some form some form of like secular Catholic guilt. You know, I'm, I come from a very big <laughs> Plenty of Catholic guilt to go around, but it feels like this very secularism apologist nature of things to where we have to eradicate, to rejoin the whole. But frankly, the, the people that you're catering to are the ones that aren't even comfortable saying to you in person that you should probably make changes. And if you stood your ground for a quarter of a second, you'd be surprised how quickly they're willing to let you exist in those spaces. Yeah, well, absolutely. Um, I, I think that's fascinating. I love the way you talk about them being primary sources because I'm a history major and and yeah, they to me, they do exist exactly as primary sources and also peeks into people's brains. Uh, you, at the Shrugged, you know, so many people hate, hate, hate At the Shrugged. I used to keep a copy of it on my desk because it would be like the litmus test. Anyone will tell you everything you need to know about them by their reaction to that book. But at the end of the day, you can just be like, you're just getting a view into this this Russian lady's head. She escaped from communism, and this is what she yeah. believed in. And this is the way she saw the world. She's not God. She doesn't, you know. It's, right. It's uh, not. It's not. Yeah. Just because you agree with three percent, perhaps, of a philosophical yeah. world, does not mean that you're going to entirely bring in the good ego or whatever and make that your entire core personality. Some people might, but in, in the same way, um, people marched on communism because they read Marx or Lenin or yeah. whatever the case may be. And, you know, I think that's, I think not understanding or reading your history is doing yourself a disservice in a free country, in an in a, in a articulate society. I think it's your obligation to at least understand why you oppose or agree with something. And if you can't read or articulate that, you're running from something and it's probably yourself. That's, I did not expect a philosoph philosophy lesson this morning, but what a all right, we've we've diver diverged a bit from the books. Yes, we um, have. I, I apologize. I mean, I should really be selling my book as hard as I can over here, but here we are talking about Anne Rand. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, at least this—that's I mean, one of the things I was excited about as well. Is you're a phenomenal writer. I love all the the articles you wrote on Commando Bond. There was the one where you broke down all of the medals that Pierce Brosnan was wearing in the first, and maybe I think it's the only time he wore his his commander's uniform, wasn't it? Yeah, and tomorrow never dies. Yeah, I found some really fascinating military blogs that like deep level discussed the ribbons and bangs and 
And then that allowed me to go, okay, great. Well, this creates a story of where he would have been when, which means in, in that article in particular, um, what watch he would have been issued during his time in the SBS and what makes that really fascinating and all this. And I, I love that stuff. Cause I think it's, it kind of ties you into the, into the, what if, you know, there's so many, so many things have been said about the bond franchise, what stones can you still turn? Um, and I think stuff like that is, is where you, you get to have a little bit of fun. You get to play the, what if, uh, I really enjoy writing pieces like that for sure. And it's, and it's fascinating because in some ways every James Bond was their own character because yeah. Pierce Brosnan's James Bond served in Rhodesia when they were trying to, to uh, standardize the elections, which I thought was such an interesting detail to tell us. But Sean Connery's James Bond, of course, that existed before that even happened. Yeah, exactly. And so it's one of those things like what story are you most fascinated by? Is it the OSS SOE connections? Is it the post-war Cold War bond? Is it the the late 80s, early 90s, who would have been really well versed in like the Soviet takeover of Afghanistan or whatever the case may be. And that's why the films are equally as fun because they, in the same way, they worked so hard to be cutting edge. They became period pieces in and of themselves. Each one of those, you know, I've got, got them all, or at least all the ones that were released on VHS, you know, over there, you crack open one of those hard cases and you slip one in the, the tape player. Suddenly the, uh, you're transported into a completely different world because every detail is as cutting edge as 1962 could have it. Well, that means it's very 1962, <laughs> you know, it's, or Roger Moore wearing a pulsar watch or a, a Oh God. Yes. Movement. You know, because that was, that was in vogue at the time. And so it's, that pulls you down a whole other rabbit hole. Uh, I don't know when this will release, but I just finished writing an article for watches of espionage and the dispatch on the other watches of James Bond, about the Seikos, about the Pulsars, about the Tag Heuer. Oh, that's fascinating. And the Breitlings and things, because, you know, those are these, <clears throat> these little pieces that appear um, that people don't think about. Um, or if they do, they're they're very, very ingrained in that world of Bond. And it's it's just cool. And I, I, I enjoy these little rabbit holes, and especially when it comes to the EDC equipment, right? Like daily carry for bond and the, the average American is probably not the, the backpack with all the medical gear and all these things that people go on these hour long tangents on online. It's probably a handgun. If you're lucky, a spare magazine, maybe a knife wallet and a good watch. So that's kind of it. So understanding and bond, frankly, is the most minimalist when it comes to those things. He primarily has a handgun. I mean, if you're lucky in the novels, he usually shoots one magazine and throws a gun away because he's out of bullets. So, you know, he doesn't really carry spare ammo. Um, so he's got his gun and his watch, and that's really it. And so these, I think these tools, because they're the tools of the everyman and the tools of James Bond, are absolutely fascinating. Well, but as we're wrapping up, we let's go to exactly what you're talking about, which is the extra information where you talk about yes. uh, things that are kind of outside that. You are at the moment, as of today, I believe, $426,890 funded for your Kickstarter for Licensed Troubleshooter, which, by the way, is amazing. Would you have thought that in, in like just 20 days or something, you would have raised over $400,000 towards your a book? It's it's crazy, especially in the the niche in which we're discussing. I'm so I'm so thrilled for the folks. And what's crazy is we still have goals and plans and hopes and dreams for as we continue to ascend. Right? You see the five hundred thousand dollar mark. If we reach that in the next double oh seven days, today is Thursday, which we launched the book on a Thursday morning. So you know we've got through late Friday of next week, so October eleventh at end of business day or end of day. I think is midnight is when it closes. Um, if we hit the five hundred thousand dollar mark, I get bullied into writing a whole other section on the guns of Goldeneye N sixty four. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. This is why yeah. I was like, I have to talk to Caleb and we have to get this video out ASAP because I want that so badly. Yeah, it's going to um, be really cool. I mean, I got to shoot suppressed scorpions or the club um, yeah. in a basement range the other day, and the suppressed P ninety, and I've, I've handled so many of these guns, and we've. We want to tell their story, but it's like I've cut so much from the book already, and it's like, okay, well, we're editing and this and that. So the benefit of the Kickstarter is people get to take part in the process. They get to have a voice, and they get to go, okay, great. Um, you know, you're voting with your dollars, and you go, all right, we we do want additional content in here. We're not just satisfied with what's already been put in front of us. So 
let's get down to business. And then the other thing too on the Kickstarter, which I'm really happy about, is the fact that we were able to do what Headstamp has done in the past, which has had at least one Kickstarter exclusive cover. We doubled down on it, one for the literary, one for the cinematic. Yeah. A good friend of mine did the illustration in the chopping style for the literary one. It's probably one of my favorite things we've ever done. Um, it's very, very, I like, I love it with the, the knife in the beach and the PPK and, yeah. and Goldeneye in the background. It's like, it's beautiful. It looks yeah. exactly like it's the old. So fun. Fun. It was like, yeah, we wanted to do the, like the old first editions, right? And I thought the biggest tragedy of the first edition covers is we never had one with the PPK on it, ever. Yeah. And so we're like, okay, we'll just do that. And actually he illustrated, uh, you can see some of the details on it. He illustrated my PPK, my 1967 threaded one. So this exact gun is what's on the cover with the Burns Martin triple draw shoulder holster, which I also have right here. Which so, of course it wouldn't fit. The wouldn't PPK. fit for the fictional holster with the, with the, with the gun, you know, Ian Fleming's golden eye on the hill above. Um, we picked some native flowers from Jamaica because well, Chopping always used flowers on the cover. And then we, my last favorite reference image is like you said, that, that knife in the beach, beautiful photos of Fleming. He did back in the day where he was walking around in safari camp shirt, throwing a machete into the sands of his beach right in front of his home. And so we used that as an inspiration to bring that particular style of blade onto the cover. I love it. Just so much thought going into it. And then, I mean, I really like the, the cinematic edition. Which oh yeah, like the skyfall illustration is fun. And that's going to be, everything you see that looks gold-ish is going to be gold foil inlay. So that yeah. will be in, embossed into the into the cover, giving you just another little detail. Um, and that's what I love about these books is they're so very thoughtful in all the small details. And what I hope, and what I hope people see when they see these covers, is it's not just, okay, well, they did really good on the, the outside packaging. I do want you to judge this book by the cover because all the small details on the interior are just as meticulously thought out, argumented, overly debated, edited six to seven times, heavily researched as what you just saw right there. And so that's, to me, what makes me so happy about this is I wouldn't be satisfied if it was done any other way. I did it with the right people, and we did it in the most esoteric and niche possible manner with the most detail that we could possibly provide. That's, and so if you get to 500,000, I should say when you get to 500,000 rather than if, um, yeah. is the stuff on GoldenEye just going to get added to the back of the book or is it just uh, going to get a It'll add to the book. It won't be a separate book. So it'll be an additional yeah. section like the other one that we did, which was the Billy Waugh section, another really cool primary source story that I strongly encourage people to check out. He, he wrote a book with another gentleman called Hunting the Jackal. I think it's going to be a really cool story because – he started his career in, in special operations back in Vietnam. He actually started as just a, as a grunt in Korea, but he started special operations during the Vietnam War, and he was one of the first CIA operatives on the ground during the Global War on Terror in his, in his 80s. So, you know, in the same era of time where James Bond has been replaced by five different actors, this one yeah. guy was hunting international terrorists, using suppressed firearms, doing all this crazy stuff. So What's he, he banging hot Russian chicks? You know, neither confirm or deny. Because <laughs> <laughs> then he would be the real life James Bond and age appropriate. He certainly has special. But I mean, he hunted a dude named Carlos the Jackal. If that's not a Bond villain. I don't know who is. Oh, no. It's, I love it. It's like sometimes truth influences fiction, and then sometimes fiction influences like what actually happens in the real world, like some of the stuff that's going on with drones and things. It's terrifying. So, you know, I, I, I enjoy those little pieces and then of course more bond is always more fun so golden eye section is going to be probably one of my favorite things we add to the book um provided we get there and yeah the, we track down as many fun of those guns as possible and we will i think people will enjoy the design aesthetic that we choose for that as well oh, i bet well as we're wrapping up okay so Hopefully, if anyone's watching this, if they haven't heard of Caleb's book, they should go and check it out. Kickstarter is still running for 10 days. Yeah, 10 final days. So it closes, like I said, come Friday, October 11th at end of day. So you have the opportunity to head over to Kickstarter. Um, you know, there's all the things. The, the, like I said already, there's a handful of editions of the book. There's signed editions. There's packages. There's bundles. There's, you know, we are the Billy Mays over here. You know, there's definitely a, but wait, there's more kind of moment here. So whatever you want and more, we probably have it. Um, we appreciate the support. I really appreciate the support. I am wild. This is going to be a book that I think Bond fans should have. It's going to be like an essential 
an essential thing to have in your coffee That's table. That's the thing I'm most excited about here, right? Is I think this is a book that I'm very, very blessed and fortunate and appreciative of the support we've had right out of the gate with the pre-sale. But I hope this is a book that we can do a print run of every year. And it's something that we sell out of for Christmas gifts, right? It's it's the holiday, it's the birthday gift, it's the quintessential Bond fan gift because right now we're in this weird Bond vacuum. And so, you know, there's not a lot of hard goods. You know, I appreciate people to put out videos and do the things and all that, but there's something to be said about tangible products that you yeah. can bring into your collection and celebrate and enjoy. I want this to be a book that someone like you that maybe, which you have, uh, I think, a more fascination with firearms than the average fan that might just be somewhat interested, but the kind of book that you can sit down, because it's, it's a large format coffee table book, yep. open it up with your morning coffee, read a section, enjoy the photography, soak it in, have the cocktail conversation for that work party you've got next week, and revisit it. You know, just slow and, and enjoy it. It's it's like a good whiskey. It's something you can, I want you to plow through, don't get me wrong, but I'd be very happy if you just take your time as well. And you know, like I said, if you enjoy the photos, brilliant. If you take the time to read what I've written next to them, all the better. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. And finally, what are you going to be working on next? And when will the Guns of Indiana Jones come out? Well, I have an article I've already written for Gun Broker on the Guns of Indiana Jones. It's a rather <laughs> small subject matter. Um, if I if it could be more, it would probably be a whole book in and of itself. I'd be love I'd love to do that, but um, I think a pamphlet would probably not sell as well <laughs> as yeah. this is. But I won't say yet, but I will say I've got a handful of other projects that I'm trying to get off the ground in the near future. Um, we're getting final edits done on Licensed Troubleshooter. Kickstarter obviously informs what other things get added in. So more than likely, the next thing I'll be working on is the Guns of Golden in 64 to add it to our book. Uh, and then after that, I, I think you guys will really, really enjoy what I've got coming. Um, provided it all works the way we want it to, it's going to be really fun. Oh, that is fantastic. Caleb, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I am so excited about this project. I am so wildly like impressed and amazed at what you've achieved. And the thank great you. thing is when I met you uh, at Gatherall, it's like, yeah, you were even at 11 o'clock at night, you were sitting down there. I, I got to buy your gin and tonic, which I take great pleasure in. But you were yeah. there editing photos at the same time. It's like your work ethic and the amount of work and effort that you've put into not just this book, but your career as, as a whatever you are now because you always defy expectations <laughs> but it's great your photography has just become amazing uh your the articles you write are fantastic like all the skills that you have are going to make this book brilliant so i'm so excited for it appreciate that a lot and you know the best part about it too is i got to work with with james and ian and you know iron sharpens iron so so well and so i've got a guy like ian mccollum doing technical review and editing so he and I spar and we grow and I've learned so yeah. much work with him and he's learned plenty about things that he probably never thought he'd learn about working with me. So it's been really, really cool kind of just watching and feeling the evolution of what I'm doing because of the people I'm working with. Because, yeah, you work with a higher caliber individual, you punch up, you you end up getting pulled up with them. And that's kind of Yeah. I mean, they always say that you are the average of the five people you're around most. So you could not I can't, have... I can't, I can't be too mad if I if that those are the folks that I'm circling myself around with. Absolutely. Oh, well, Caleb, thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording now. But uh, yeah, the gun, uh, licensed troubleshooter, the guns of James Bond. Check out that Kickstarter right below. Oh, give us a beauty shot of the gun you're holding right there. That's gorgeous. There we go. Hopefully we won't get demonetized for that. <laughs>